Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. Is the science on vaping settled? It's an interesting question since the answer on either side of the debate is a resounding yes. For vapors, vaping saves lives, and after a decade of use, there are over 40 million vapors across the world, vaping has proven to be shown safe. Yet, if you are one of the uncountable numbers of public health workers, academic researchers, or even a regional mouthpiece for a nonprofit health group, then you believe vaping is deadly and a scourge of modern day society. So which side is it? Which side is anti-science? Well, joining us today to help us answer that question and more is Dr. Chris Lalonde, professor of psychology at the University of Victoria and academic advisor for rightsforvapors.com, a Canadian vaping advocacy group. Dr. Lalonde, thanks for coming back on RegWatch. Thanks for having me back. It's always a pleasure to be talking with you. Um, we're going to be spending uh, quite a bit of time in today's show, Dr. Lalonde, talking about the Stanton Glass study scandal and other examples of what we here at RegWatch call suspect science. And trust me, I'd like to call it junk science, but more on that later. <laughs> so first, let's dive into the big news yesterday by the Ontario provincial government, where they announced Ontario will restrict flavored vapes in an effort to curb youth consumption. We have a clip here from City News, so uh, let's jump into that. becoming addicted to nicotine vaping products, according to the province. Recent evidence indicates a 74% increase in youth vapors from 2017 to 2018, which is why the province is putting forward a seven-step proposal to try and combat this growing health problem. <laughs> what are your thoughts on vaping? Uh, it's kind of just the thing to do, I guess. Why? Uh, it's well, they say it's possibly better than smoking cigarettes. Not enough is known about vaping health risks. Health Canada says vaping is less harmful than smoking, but there are still consequences and a lot of the long-term effects aren't known. We've seen reports of young people being hospitalized and diagnosed with severe lung disease, with 18 reported cases of vaping-related severe pulmonary illness in Canada. In 2017, nearly 11% of Ontario youth between grades 7 to 12 used e-cigarettes in the past year. They make it fruity. So people are like, oh, it's fruity, it's good for you. Parents frustrated, wondering what supports are available for their teenager's addiction. Teachers left helpless, watching far too many of their students vaping just meters away from the edge of school property. Our government is proposing regulatory changes that, if approved, would limit where flavored and high nicotine vapor products can be sold, while expanding prevention programs and services to quit vaping. Flavors like bubblegum will be sold at specialty vape stores restricted to people aged 19 and over. The exception, menthol, mint and tobacco flavors. We're trying to find a balance here between the uh, restricting youth from getting involved in vaping in the first place, but also recognizing that there are some adults who legitimately want to use uh, vaping products in order to quit smoking. Other suggestions include selling nicotine vapor products with more than 20 milligrams exclusively at specialty stores. Advertisements will also not be visible outside those storefronts. And for those dealing with a nicotine addiction, more mental health and addiction services. This is all coming a little too late, according to the opposition. This should have been something that they never had access in the first place, that we should not have had advertising in corner stores and convenience stores across from schools in the first place. The province says they are strongly advocating for the federal government to work with Ontario to tax vaping products as young people have less disposable income to spend compared to other consumers. If the proposed regulation changes get approved, majority of them would come into effect on May 1st of this year. So uh, <laughs> there's uh, quite a bit of a look on her face there as she kind of delivers that uh, closing there. Yeah. What do you think, Chris? Before. What do you think? What do you think, Chris, about what Ontario um, is doing here with the proposed changes? Um, a lot of them are just illogical and make no sense to me whatsoever. Um, it's very clear that young people, teens, are using it's not for the flavors, but for the nicotine buzz. So, if you want to 
restrict nicotine strengths to specialty vape shops, I'm fine with that. Um, if you want to make advertising not visible, that doesn't matter. The biggest advertisers for e-cigarettes are the CDC and health groups that just keep running and rerunning Juul ads from years ago. Um, that's fine. The several things about it don't make any sense to me. So why would you allow tobacco and mint and menthol in corner stores and gas stations? It seems to me if you think that's where youth are getting their hands on these things, are you just training them to like the taste of tobacco? Adult smokers don't choose a tobacco flavor. They choose something else. They don't want to be reminded of the taste of tobacco. So the sort of war on flavors, it seems to me, is just plain misplaced. The second thing, there are a bunch of other little things that they're doing. They're going to limit the size of bottles, which just seems to me to be an ecological crime. Why replace one 120 milliliter bottle with 12 10 milliliter plastic bottles. They're not reusable, they'll end up in the landfill or the garbage. Um, the worst one, I think, is the tax. So we know from lots of studies that youth do not get e-cigarettes from corner stores or specialty vape shops. They get them from friends and relatives, uh, whether they pay for them or given them or steal them, who knows? But um, it seems to me that they're not going to be very price sensitive. But the worst part about it is, well, there's two worst parts about it. One is there's no guarantee that the revenue from that tax would actually be used in ways to combat youth vaping or youth smoking or improve youth health, uh, mental health and addictions, which I think is a good thing. Um, but what it will do is it will add just another barrier for adult smokers, particularly low income and vulnerable people, to, to try and switch to vaping. Because the more the price resembles that of cigarettes, the less likely people are to switch. So if you keep stoking the fear that e-cigarettes are as dangerous or more dangerous than cigarettes, um, you're discouraging people from taking control of their lives and switching to vaping. Okay, that's a really bad thing. The other thing that disturbs me to no end is she mentions the vaping related illness. Now, the CDC has finally, finally, after we've known for months, said, look, it's vitamin E acetate and illicit THC cartridges that cause this. In fact, we're not going to issue any more updates on the number of cases anymore because they pretty much disappear. But the minister managed to just toss that in without mentioning that it's illicit THC products, just that it's vaping related. And when the public hears vaping related, they think e-cigarettes. They don't think illicit THC cartridges sold out of the trunk of a car by a drug dealer, right? They think of the vape shop down the road. And I think that's really a dangerous message to be sending for a health minister. It was the most disturbing uh, on from our ears to hear that, a, a direct yeah. immediate link to 18 cases of uh, severe mm -hmm. pulmonary illness and yeah. uh, that that how could they public health in ontario not know the truth in this matter well exactly brent and that's really worrying to me that public health and uh, lung association and all kinds of supposed public health groups have been conflating these two things long after it was known that it was thc so they would say things like well 58% reported only using e-cigarette, nicotine e-cigarettes. Well, these are teenagers in states in the U.S. where THC marijuana is illegal. So, of course, they're not going to tell the doctor or the nurse with their parents sitting beside their hospital bed that, well, yeah, I was vaping THC, right? But when the CDC finally got around to doing the testing, they found that it's THC, dummy, like who, who would have thunk it would be something else? How could people be vaping for 10 years around the world and the only place that this thing pops up is a very restricted geographic area in a very short period of time? Classic epidemiology would tell you that's a contaminant in the supply system somewhere. And they found out pretty early on, but they were really remarkably and I think dangerously slow in warning the right people, don't vape illicit THC cartridges. Chris, here in Canada, there's not a lot of expertise on the harm reduction side uh, from academia and so forth who can comment on this to push back on health authorities across the country. What's your message to the health ministers? Is this the right approach that uh, Christine Elliott is taking? No, this is not the right approach. They just announced another tax measure in Alberta. BC announced one a few months ago. Um, I think if you follow the data, so we have a natural kind of experiment here. Some provinces at the moment are going to be introducing a tax. So if you are of the school that thinks that, well, increasing the price is going to decrease consumption, 
right, then you would expect vaping to go down in BC, Alberta, and Ontario. And it might. I think it won't go down very much. What you'll do is you'll slow the increase in vaping that we see among adults and youth. Um, But what you'll also see, and I would be willing to bet hard money on this, is that the decline in cigarette smoking rates is also going to stop. I mean, it might not stop, but it'll slow. So you will see declines in cigarette smoking use in BC, Alberta, and Ontario that are less than you see in other provinces that don't have a tax. Um, Getting rid of flavors, this war on flavors, is so counterintuitive to me that I, I don't understand how you can justify it. You can stand there all day saying these flavors are uniquely appealing to youth. Well, there just isn't a flavor on earth that's uniquely appealing to youth. I mean, one of the examples I like to use is that actual cotton candy consumption in the U.S., 70% of the cotton candy is consumed by adults, right? So if cotton candy were somehow uniquely attracting to children, you wouldn't expect that. You'd expect the majority of cotton candy to be consumed by children, and it's not. Adults like flavors too, and in fact, adults need flavors if they're going to switch completely from smoking cigarettes to vaping. Do you think these measures taken in Ontario and other provinces across the country are going to lead to more people smoking? I do. Yeah, I do. I don't think the smoking rate is going to go up. It's been relentlessly going down, and we should be celebrating that. The latest Canadian statistics say 1% of high school students in grades 10 to 12 are current or daily smokers. 1%, right? We're not celebrating that. It's like 0.4% for grades 7 to 12 nine or something. Um, We're not celebrating that. We're freaking out because 20% have tried an e-cigarette in the last 30 months or the last 12 months. We should be freaking out about alcohol and cannabis. There are lots of other more risky things that youth are doing that we would be better advised to spend our public health resources on than kids who have a puff on an e-cigarette at a party on a Saturday night. That's just not the target. if If I may, Chris, could you phrase that in a way that's addressing parents? Uh, Sure, I would tell them of all the things that you need to worry about, vaping is probably the least of them. Okay, you've got kids that are binge drinking on a way more frequent basis than are using e-cigarettes. You've got kids that are smoking, kids that are engaging in unprotected sex, that are using psychoactive drugs. The list goes on and on and on. And the last thing you should be panicking about is vaping. You don't want your kids to do it, that's fine. But think of all the other things that they might do. And particularly if their access to e-cigarettes is limited, then how likely are they to go on to smoke tobacco cigarettes? In both cases, youth are not marching into the corner store and buying a pack of cigarettes or an e-cigarette. They're getting them from social sources for both tobacco and e-cigarettes. They're getting them from friends, family, and other people. Um, So if you want to lower the rate of youth smoking or youth vaping, it's an enforcement issue. It's not a taxation issue. That's not going to stop kids if the price of a, a disposable e-cigarette goes from $5 to $6. They're not going to say, oh, well, I haven't got that extra dollar. Right? It's just, I don't think it's going to happen. And obviously, there's very uh, little discussion about what I'm about to bring up here in the mainstream media, but within the vaping community and within a harm reduction, uh, taxes are the enemy because what they do is they prevent smokers from, from quitting yeah, because absolutely. one of the... One of the biggest draws of quitting is saving the money. When I Absolutely. quit, when I quit smoking, I quit a nine thousand dollar a year after tax habit. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's way funner habits to have. I mean, you might Absolutely. not live as long; they'll kill you quicker <laughs> than smoking will. But the fact of the matter is, yeah. is that it's a massive amount of money. Yeah. And you know, for those these decades as that was ramping up, I mean, I remember in 2011, 12, by 2013. And the BC Liberal government here in British Columbia just glommed on the, the stuff by 2015. I was like, gimme, I'm done. I literally, I can't, yeah. right? I cannot keep yeah. doing it. And, um, you know, but if they hike up uh, all the taxes on, on vaping product, they kill one of the best reasons why you would quit. Well, exactly. Exactly. And the, the justification for raising taxes on tobacco cigarettes has always been that people are price sensitive. When you increase the price, you will reduce consumption. So if you apply that logic to vaping, it's completely counterintuitive. So you'd have to somehow say we are willing to sacrifice adult smokers who might otherwise have switched to vaping on the promise that maybe teens will use fewer e-cigarettes. Now, in public health, 
you have to kind of keep your eye on the prize here. So if what you really want to do is reduce injury and death, then you have to remember that you need to, the injuries and deaths are caused by specific exposures to risk. The more you're exposed, the higher the risk. That's why people die of lung cancer in their 50s and 60s and not in their teens or 20s, right? Um, so you have to ask, who's the most risky population? Well, that's people that have been smoking for decades. Um, it tends to be more frequent in more vulnerable populations, lower income populations. So you would think if what you really want to do is save lives and reduce harm, you would target all your efforts on those adult long-term cigarette smokers. So for teens who pick up an e-cigarette and try it at a party, I'm not worried. Even if they become regular users, there's lots and lots of time to change that behavior. Okay? First of all, there's not a lot of evidence that there's any long-term risk. They keep saying, we don't know the long-term risks. I think that's kind of a cop-out. If, if that's the way we ran public health, we would never introduce a new drug into society because we don't know the long-term effects, right? Um, so I think you need to say, if you want to do like the provinces are doing and say, look, we're willing to throw adults under the bus for the sake of the hypothetical safety of some teens. Okay. If that's what you want to do, just say it, right. And I'll be honest about it. So when we talked last, uh, I think it was June around that time, yeah. it was right after Dr. David Hammond's study that had propelled, uh, you know, fueled uh, the Canadian reaction to the so-called epidemic of teen vaping. And um, we, RegWatch got a leaked version of that uh, study. We published it because it wasn't going to be out during the consultation process, which meant that yep. academic researchers and all of these body part orgs, thanks to Grim Green for that, uh, for that moniker, I'm going to use that when appropriate. So the mm -hmm. body part orgs, uh, lung, heart, blah, anyhow, they, um, they had access to it. So did the CBC and Kelly Crow doing major pieces in December mm -hmm. of 2018. So by the time 2019 rolls around, everybody and their dog had all of this research, including Health Canada, except for harm reduction and vaping advocates and so forth. We published that uh, and uh, you came on right after the uh, mm -hmm. study was um, published in uh, the British Medical Journal. Now in that piece, there was the outstanding claim that vaping had skyrocketed 74% year over year. And I believe that is the exact stat that mm -hmm. the health minister used, as well as in that, stu in that study, it said that smoking had gone up 45%. And yeah. you, you and I spent quite a bit of time talking about like, where's the common sense as a researcher on that? Yeah. Uh, so here we are now, uh, a year and a half later, or so, well, a year later, I guess, it's been, the, the study was in market basically though since in November of 2018. Um, so here we are, and that research is still affecting regulatory yeah. outcomes. Yeah. What's, what, what's wrong and, with that? Well, there's a lot of things that are wrong with that. First of all, when someone says 74% increase, what the public hears is 74% of teens are vaping, okay? Um, and that's not true at all. And so very shortly after uh, the BMJ piece came out, uh, numbers came out of Health Canada um, that, uh, you know, are a lot more likely to be accurate because they're based on a much, much bigger sample size. And they showed no 45 percent increase, no 74 percent increase. Um, so but people aren't talking about that data. They continue to bang the drum of the BMJ paper, which I think is misleading. So I've got uh, I've got that some of that here. Here's the current smoker daily by age group. I don't know if yeah. you see that. Okay. Yeah, I can see it. And yeah. so look for yeah. So 2018, you got 0.9 percent of 12 to 17 year olds. Okay. The even more recent number is 0.4. Um, well, no, it's not 12 to 17. It would be 12 to 16. Um, and so smoking rates keep going down. Let's celebrate, right? Um, so which one is the smokers by age group? So you got 3.2% daily or occasional. So that bumps the numbers up, occasional smokers. I mean, daily smokers are the ones that, if you're a public health official, they're the ones you should be worried about, right? Right, um, exactly. They're the ones with the most immediate threat. Right, um, right. And so you can see the percentages are much higher for older Canadians, right? Sorry, I've just got to, we're, we're, okay. back, we're going back here through my folder for some of the graphics from your piece last year. And here we okay. jumped into, I had here, interestingly enough, 
smoking and mortality. And each year there are more than 230,000 deaths in Canada. This is sitting here for a reason. Uh, the re the, we're going to dive into this part of the conversation right now. And then I think we'll, we'll do the back end of it on glance because you've already brought up a couple of times here, um, Dr. Lalonde, this kind of, this issue, like you don't know how they can justify it. I mean, how could they justify, you know, calling it vaping related lung illness, you know, conflating it with nicotine vaping to, the, to yesterday? Like that's insane. Yeah. How can they do that? How can they justify the taxes when it's, it's basically going to drive people away from vaping? It's going to keep people smoking. All of these things, how can they justify it? So funny to have this in here because this is how far back this goes now for me, as I realize now I've been suspicious of the forecasts of deaths uh, in Canada and the U.S. since as far back as this. So I, up until last show, I was saying it was when the vaping-related lung illness came out and I heard vaping-related lung uh, illness and I went, well, what's different than, you know, smoking-related disease? You know, two catch-all groups that just takes anything in it. And it's both by the same, you know, group, CDC and public health. So it actually has been longer than that. And that's why that's sitting in here because quite frankly, after hearing what we heard from Dr. Brad Rodu, um, I've got very little faith at all that these people um, aren't lying about uh, uh, these potential deaths. Yeah, I uh, listened to your conversation with Brad and uh, big shout out to Brad for all the work that he's been doing over decades now. Um, and what I found most illuminating, frightening, is that even the CDC has never seen the data used to model the number of tobacco-related deaths. So I think your curiosity was piqued by the question, how is it that the prevalence of smoking can drop every year, but the number of deaths for tobacco-related diseases somehow remains the same? Okay. And so Brad, I think, did a great job of, uh, of talking about that, that, okay, for one, the population continues to grow, right? Um, so even though the prevalence of smoking goes down, the number of people who smoke may stay the same or, or may increase. And the other is there's a time lag between um, when you start smoking and possible health consequences. They tend to happen later in life. But still, um, it seems to me, I think you have the right intuition that, gee, we should be seeing some slight decrease in that some 450, 480,000 in the U.S. Um, over time given the remarkable declines in smoking rates that we've seen over the last seven or eight years, right? But we're not. And if there were good solid data to support that, I'd say, okay, but until we can see what the model is based on, I think we should be rightly skeptical about that number. Now, it may be 435 instead of 450 or 425 instead of 480, whatever. It's still a remarkably high and worrisome number. And I think in some ways, the value of that number is it should be focusing people's attention on the real problem here. Okay, the real problem is not the kid in the high school bathroom with a jewel who may go on to smoke cigarettes later. That's not the big problem. Right? We have plenty of time to reach that kid later if that's what happens. And there's no evidence of, of Gateway actually being a real thing to begin with. But um, I just, I, I cannot understand how someone could say, I'm a public health official. My job is to protect the health of the public. And uh, I'm going to focus my attention on the least worrisome problem and ignore the most worrisome. I can't find a justification for that. And what it says to me, I'm, I'm a little more bleak on this, right? I, I believe mm -hmm. that maybe it's subconscious then, but it's one of the reasons why they, they don't seem to care. Vapors say, they've got two arguments. Vapors say, vaping saves lives. Well, right. if the lives numbers are, are, are actually much less of people actually dying, right? But only they know, right? Or seem to have a sense of, right? Well, then then they're not so, you know, apt to really hear that argument so much. Like they, there's something going on about why public health is not recognizing going, well, there's a half a million people going to die this year and vaping can save lives. Well, if there is not a half a million people going to die and because there isn't and they're just vague numbers and they're all population level thinking anyhow. So how many real hospital trips are they making every year? Anyhow, you know, not many. So in the mm -hmm. end, I, I think that that number plays a role in, in decreasing the ability of vapors to get that point across that vaping saves lives. Well, I think you're right uh, to the extent that 
um, people on the anti-vaping side aren't ready to accept the argument that vaping saves lives. They'll say, you know, a million vapors in Canada all say, I feel better, I don't cough, I don't wheeze. But, well, that's just anecdotal data. But if you ask in a survey of high school students, in the past year, have you had a puff on a cigarette or an e-cigarette? Well, that's data. See, there's a big difference there. So you do a telephone survey of 500 teenagers, that's data. You have thousands upon thousands of Canadians saying, vaping saved my life. I know that. If I had continued to smoke, my doctor said, you're going to die. So I took up vaping, and now my lungs are clear, and my CO2, I don't have to use my inhaler anymore. Um, but that's just anecdote. So there is a, a kind of ideological stance that is just resistant to the notion that vaping could save lives. Yeah, there is. A, it's ideology, uh, again, rearing its ugly head. The... Um yeah. Well, it's disturbing to me. There's something really crooked in there uh, when you when you find out that CDC doesn't even have these numbers. They've not even seen the data. So how they yeah. can be operating this way. Well, I mean, it's apparent. I, it, it just and you look at coronavirus. How did the CDC? They're so busy on the so-called epidemic of teen vaping that whatever kits they had to even test for coronavirus in the U.S. all failed when they put them in market when they were needed. Yeah. They, they failed. And something like yeah. only 38 people have been tested in the U.S. so far. Yeah. You know, the CDC is also responsible for putting out numbers, the, the big, huge, massive controversy. Well, it wasn't a controversy. Uh, ruined many people's lives. Uh, but they're the ones that put out the uh, stats uh, that said that, you know, one in four college women in the U.S. will be raped. <laughs> and that's what the president... And the vice president and the current, uh, you know, Democratic front runner, <laughs> Biden. Anyhow, the fact of the matter is the CDC is corrupt. They're in their, they're in it all over the place. They've got their, their, you know, their necks right up into wokeness, if not being probably the primary agency uh, in North America that's been driving it for at least 30 or 40 years. I think the CDC is corrupt. Well, I, I'm not sure I'm willing to go that far. Misguided, fine. Um, but the amount of grant money that gets distributed in the United States to uh, researchers who clearly are anti-harm reduction is astounding. Um, so we could go through lots of examples. The formaldehyde scare, which uh, e-cigarettes are going to give you popcorn lung, and, and we could talk about that. They get rewarded with million dollar grants. Stanton Glantz, the amount of money that's been poured into his lab to produce what you called suspect science is just astonishing. Um, but the major government-based grant agencies in the U.S. very clearly have an agenda that is anti-harm reduction. And so what you find is that studies that hype the risks and ignore the benefits of vaping are the ones that get funded. And that's disturbing. Yeah, it's the, um, yeah, I mean, it's from a point of view. I mean, the, the government has a strategy to be smoke free. So that means all research right. has got to drive that agenda. All ships must sail in the same direction. It's the same with climate change. It's disgusting. Every single federal dollar goes to whatever. It has to just prove climate change. Climate change is a given already. You can't get money to try to actually research anything else besides the party line on climate change. And it's, you know, I say this to our viewers all the time. If you can't believe what they've done to the science of vaping, and then you go out and march in a climate change parade, you should stick your vaping thing right in your eye and just do that over <laughs> and over and over again. Because until you understand that they actually are doing this and have done it and perfected the skills and techniques uh, in other science, then you're nuts. And you, you said something to me in um, our pre-interview when we had a call before today's show, and it was a, I don't know exactly what it was. I don't want to put the words in your mouth, but you've, you, do you believe that epidemiology is a credible line of science? Whew. Epidemiology is a set of tools, right, to be used to hopefully generate new knowledge that works to protect and promote human health. Um, but the number of examples in uh, studies of vaping that, uh, 
clearly the data has been so tortured to somehow support a preconceived notion. There are just too many of those to count, and it's depressing. And, you know, I'm a, a psychologist, I'm a scientist, research is what I do, and the research marches forward by following the current science, right? By trusting, by imagining that the work that other people who've done, who came before you, is a, a kind of guidepost to where to go in the future. And if you find out that somebody faked their data, Andrew Wakefield, um, or kind of cooked the books to come up with some um, preconceived conclusion, um, that harms science, that harms progress, and then eventually that harms people's health, right? Um, and so that's what really bothers me. Epidemiology is a tool, a set of tools, and used correctly has great potential. Used incorrectly has great potential to mislead. And the misleading is not just for other researchers like me. The real core danger here is that if people discover, as vapors have discovered, that the government is trying to mislead you, right? The body part organizations are actively misleading you, then you lose trust in those organizations and those government agencies. And if you lose trust in government health agencies, that's a really dangerous thing, right? So, you know, then don't be surprised when anti-vaxxers pop up, right? Because you've lost their trust. If you fool them once, they're just not going to believe you again. And um, that has really big ramifications for public health. Yeah, I do agree. You had mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Glantz's funding, and I think it's really important to spend a little bit more time on that. I've got a uh, clip here that we prepared. Uh, just let me make sure that we're ready to go with it. And <coughs> I've got a clip here from our interview with Dr. Rodu. Now, we're not going to play a lot of this interview because we really want you to go and watch it. Um, and we went a little bit, I don't know, too long. I think it was about a, an hour mm -hmm. 20. Really wanted to let Dr. Rodu take his time to talk about what happened after he, by the way, he was really happy for the pat on the backs that he got. Good. He and deserves it. He does deserve it. Yes, he totally yeah. does. So let's just jump to the clip here. And this is uh, Dr. Rodu. And we're having a chat, and we're having a chat about Stanton Glantz and the funding. Keep in mind this whole war against vaping. It's, it's a repeat of the same war that we've seen against other smoke-free products like smokeless tobacco. And now we're seeing it in a big way with, um, with vaping products. You know, I want to go back. I've, I, I blogged on the amount of money transferred to UCSF for S Professor Glantz's research. And I, yes, you've brought up the exact chart because look what happened. This, is, this was Professor Glantz's funding. It expanded incredibly in 2013. Now take this and multiply it by 10 by thousands of researchers across the country. That's the time when NIH funding aimed at, especially aimed at vaping, started to, um, started really to balloon. And now we're seeing all of the, all of the products of that research funding in all of the, um, all of the, it, you know, if it's if it's bad about vaping, it gets published. Period. If it's bad just, about vaping, it gets published. Yeah, I, I can't disagree. Or the, or the research gets funded. So if you look at that graph, um, I can't think of another researcher whose grant funding tripled and stayed that high in just one year. Right now, if you manage a, a whole category of research. Um, you know what you're going to get, right? You know what you're getting for your money. What do you, what do you mean by that? You know what it's you're really getting. It's really a shame. What do you, what it does really that mean? Is. You know what you're getting for your money. Well, if you so, there's a debate in the research community about whether 
government funding should be used for basic research, let's just figure out how the world works, or should we do priority research? We've got a big problem we need to solve as a society. HIV AIDS is a big problem, cancer is a big problem. So we should have a mixture of funding. So some is just basic research, let's find out how the world works and lots of good and interesting things come of that. And yes, we as a society can decide that we should make HIV AIDS a priority or the opioid crisis a priority and we should increase funding for research in that area. The problem comes when you decide uh, we not only want to pour money into this priority area, but we want to kind of take one side of the debate. And that's really problematic. And you don't see that, at least in my view, you don't see that in HIV AIDS or opioid crisis. People argue about the opioid crisis. Are we encouraging drug use if we provide needle exchange and all of this sort of stuff? You can have two sides to the debate, but if the government is only going to fund one side of the debate, bad things are going to happen. And we've seen that in vaping. You know, So the, the percentage of Americans, and I bet it's true of Canadians, who believe vaping is as dangerous or more dangerous than smoking has continuously gone up over the last seven or eight years. Now, why is that? Well, because they've had a barrage of sort of media stories and um, findings of the ilk that uh, Glantz continues to publish that creates that impression. Right. The little soundbite news media creates the impression that, you know, everybody was thinking, oh, my God, if, if you vape, you're going to drop dead of a lung injury in like a minute and a half. Right. Um, and so w as you increase that perception, and it's true of young people and it's true of adults, you decrease the likelihood that a smoker is going to switch to vaping. And that's a health tragedy. You don't have to accept vaping saves lives to understand that, look, if it's massively safer, it's a better thing to do. Riding a bike with a helmet is better than riding without one. Wearing a seatbelt is better than not wearing one. You don't have to have massive epidemiology to make that point. It's self-evidently true if you know the nature of the toxicology of the project and the product. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. You've obviously got a good, solid overview of what's happening in Canada in terms of the opposition to vaping. And there are these nonprofit health groups out there, Canadian Cancer Society, Lung Association, and so forth. Can you help for our viewers that don't really, aren't a part of this whole thing, who might just think that these are benign organizations, sort of the parents out there, let's just say, could you sure. explain to them who these uh, nonprofit health groups are, and what's their impact uh, on on this debate? Uh, I, I don't think I can explain who those groups are. They're fairly self-explanatory, heart and stroke and lung. Um, why they're so vociferously opposed to vaping is also a mystery to me. So um, unless you buy the Glantz article that vaping causes heart attacks, the um, Heart and Stroke Association should understand how much better vaping is than smoking. So why would they be actively opposing it when it actually promotes their stated views? The same with the Lung Association. I just, I, I really don't understand uh, their motivation or how they can look at the same science I'm looking at and come to a diametrically opposed conclusion. It's, so just it, to, it baffles me. It's baffling, there's no doubt. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, and of course, uh, this particular study that was purported to show that vaping leads to heart attacks uh, was retracted after this pressure campaign that Dr. Brad Rodu had been putting out there. And then, of course, the good folks at uh, New York uh, NYU College of Global Public Health, Dr. David Abrams and Dr. Nayara yeah. and a whole host of them, including David Sweener, actually up in Canada, signed this letter, put on some good pressure, and this was retracted. I'm going to show that in a second. Explain over top of this, um, is this a big deal to have this paper retracted? Uh, this is a very, very big deal. Retraction is very, very rare in science because um, if the process is working as it should, I write a grant application, I send it off to a granting agency, they send it out for peer review. The peer reviewers say, 
this is good. We like the methodology. We like the proposed analysis. You should give him the money. And they give me the money and I go and do the research. And then I write up a manuscript and I send it off to a journal and they send it out to a different set of peer reviewers who are supposed to be expert in the field. And they're the sort of final arbiter. Is this good enough to publish? Is this information that other scientists in the public need? And so in this case, they published the original article, and then Brad Rodu uh, and others discovered the kind of fatal flaw in the study and mounted a very, very long campaign to get it retracted. But what it means is uh, the findings from this paper are unreliable. That's perhaps the most charitable way to put it. Um, what's really remarkable about this whole thing is that this should have been caught at the grant application stage. If they had sufficiently described their methodology in sufficient detail, the peer reviewers should have said, no, you can't do that sort of analysis and draw any conclusions about cause and effect. Um, but they did it anyway, and then they wrote up a manuscript and they submitted it, and the peer reviewers, again, didn't say, no. That's not how cause and effect works. You have to have the cause before you have the effect, and you don't in this case. So um, it, I, I'm glad it was retracted, and again, kudos to, to Brad and others who, who made it happen, but it never should have been funded, and it never should have been published in the first place. And that's, uh, that's about as clear as you can get with regard to that. Um, just to make sure everybody understands this, there was people who were smokers uh, and they weren't able to separate the smoking as an effect or cause uh, in relation to the heart attack. And it's just plain and simple. It was just right there in the numbers. Well, no, what was actually in the numbers and the fatal flaw is that they didn't take into account when the heart attack happened. Right. So people would have a heart attack, then they would start vaping and bat and glance would include those people as their heart attack having been caused by vaping. So, you know, people say e-cigarettes are so dangerous they can travel back in time and give you a heart attack years before. Um, now, that, so might, that might be a chuckle, but the fact of the matter is, and correct me if I'm wrong, this stuff, this science dramatically affected uh, the national debate oh, on vaping. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the uptake in the mass media, it was massive. Right. And they're still reporting it. They are still there are people in body part organizations that are still pointing at that paper after it's been retracted and saying, well, look, vaping causes heart attacks. Well, no, no, it doesn't. And um, you've been you've been actually at regional health meetings and so forth where people are waving that report around. Well, yeah, I mean, they're waving. I mean, people are still waving the Helena Miracle report around from years and years ago. Um, but it is simply the case that a certain ideological faction of the sort of anti-harm reduction group will just glom on to any finding that supports their cause. There's no pause for reflection to say, how can heart attacks that happen before you start vaping be caused by vaping? So when and you have just, the preeminent, he's the preeminent tobacco control researcher in the world, Dr. Glantz is. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, if he's making mistakes like this, he doesn't seem to really... I mean, for those of you who who know him, he's got this demeanor of a, you know, a, a, a little bit of an old grumpy communist. You know, he's got the old grumpy communist. You you put him in you put him in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution, sometime around there, between Lenin and Stalin, I would say. You know, he's he's got that, and, and I'm sorry, but you know, he's charming. He's charming as a communist, sure. and sure. he had his uh he had his response here on February eighteenth, twenty twenty. And uh, his famous blog where Stanton Glantz says, Journal of American Heart Association caves to pressure from e-cig interests. Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> yeah. Um, there's an interesting tidbit in there for researchers. So uh, they claimed that they were going to do this reanalysis, but... Uh, they were suddenly, they and everybody else at UC San Francisco was denied access to the data, the, the original data set. Um, and they glance claims it was because they inadvertently published a small sample size in one of the supplementary tables. Now, a lot of people, uh, you know, on the internet, as they do, jumped on that and said, he's just making that up. It's just a, a, some kind of excuse for why they didn't run the analysis. Um, I haven't uh, seen 
seen any follow up on this. So why was UC San Francisco denied access to the to path data? Um, but my speculation is that it may be something like what happens with uh, Stats Canada. So if you look at Stats Canada reports on almost anything, if a sample size gets to be too small and the number of affected people in that sample gets to be too large, they say data suppressed. And that's because Stats Canada and Health Canada and other government agencies can only do the kind of epidemiological statistical work that they do um, if they can convince people this data is anonymous. No one will ever be able to identify you from this data set. But if you get um, a, a cell that includes a small community and how many people over the age of 80 have dementia, and it turns out it's like 50 or 60 percent, then theoretically it's possible to go to that town and figure out who the demented over 80 year olds are so health canada stats canada will say data suppressed so it could be that that's what happened in this case i don't know whether that's what happened in this case but in any case the most worrisome thing is the damage is done that study's still out there it still has legs it's still being reported even after it's been retracted um, and so you know the damage is done people believe vaping causes heart attacks and I'm not sure how you're going to change that without a concerted effort by the body part organizations and government agencies and research granting agencies um, to do the kind of work and the kind of public education that's needed to kind of set that right, to set the sort of risk perceptions around vaping to where they actually are, as opposed to where um, critics would like them to stay. Could Health Canada be doing more? Yes, Health Canada could be doing more. Now, they are like, you know, provincial health ministers. I get it. People are screaming about, think of the children, right? Oh, my God, the young people, the teens, the kids, they're all vaping. And, you know, we got to take the doors off the bathroom stalls and install expensive vape detecting equipment. Um, I get it. You know, if parents are phoning your constituency office saying, all the kids in my kid's school are vaping, they're all addicted to nicotine, the whole generation's addicted to nicotine. It's hard to ignore those voices if you're a politician or even a, a health bureaucrat, right? Um, so that's, uh, and then they, they want to play this other side of the same coin and say, we recognize vaping is safer than smoking, and so established smokers should consider switching, da 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 da, da. Um, that's all to the good. Um, but then oftentimes there's a kind of lingering puritanism that comes with that. So they'll say, yes, you should switch to vaping e-cigarettes, but you should switch completely to vaping e-cigarettes, and then you should quit e-cigarettes. Okay, so uh, add on hypothetical harms, don't know the long-term risks, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's a really complex and difficult sort of maneuver to pull off to say we're protecting youth and we're encouraging adults. So if they said we're going to put a 80% tax on youth and no tax on adults, I'd say fine. But wait a minute, it's illegal for youth to buy these things. So how is adding a tax to it going to help? Yeah, I, well, I think we should just make all youth pay a tax for being the, <laughs> the selfish, spoiled little kids yeah. that they are and yeah. all the parents, you know, I, what's really problematic for me is that at my age now, it's actually my problem. It's my peer group. It's my, the people I grew up with are, are the ones that have these sniveling kids. Actually, maybe a little bit younger now I'm getting older. So I, I don't want to, <laughs> I want to drop it too much there. So we're getting, we're getting close to wrapping, ramping up here. Um, let me ask you with regard to health Canada, what's your message? Uh, for them, because they're the last shoe to drop. Um, I think there is is now a growing, you heard it in the Ontario Health Minister saying, what we need is national leadership here, we need a national tax, we need a national ban, we need national this. Um, a part of that, I think, is uh, saving her own skin, that people can blame Ottawa if they don't like it, it wasn't me. Um, so I think that chorus is going to grow. And now the question is, if Health Canada really is serious about trying to play both sides of this, you know, reduce youth access, increase adult uptake, um, they have to do better at the kind of education and resource activities than they have been. They're far better than any U.S. organization that I can think of. Um, 
But there is still a kind of a, a certain Puritanism that kind of leaks into their education efforts. And uh, that's problematic. I think they need to get out in front of this and say, okay, job number one is to correct the incorrect perceptions of risk that the public has. Okay. So you can do that without necessarily promoting vaping among youth, right? You just need to correct the misperception among adult smokers. Well, I can't do that because vaping is dangerous. I might as well stick to my cigarettes, right? So that would be step one. Step two is if you want national leadership, then let's have a rational discussion about what is the likely effect of taxation going to be. We already have data from the states that say the smoking rate goes up. Who to thunk it? If you make vaping less attractive, less available, smoking rates, and especially smoking rates among youth, go up. So there is evidence out there to show that this is a counterintuitive idea. Uh, the same with the flavor thing. I, I can totally get put the high nick stuff in specialty shops. The high nick stuff is for long-term heavy smokers. They need that to get started. Because what you don't want to have happen is have some two-pack, 30-year smoker, um, take a puff of a three milligram e-cig and say, well, that's never going to work. And then they just reject the whole category. It's just off the table for me. Maybe I'll go try the patches again. Maybe I'll go try the gum again, whatever. Um, so heavy smokers need uh, higher nicotine. Kids don't need higher nicotine. In fact, there's a smoking cessation specialist in France who tells really heavy long-term smokers, look, if you're going to try this vaping thing, get the highest nicotine you can and go and buy patches. And for the first three days, put a couple of patches around your belly just to bump it up a little bit. And if you can survive, make it through that first three days, the chances that you will be able to stick with vaping are vastly improved. And I think he's absolutely right. I mean, that's why nicotine patches come in different strengths, right? Right, right, um, right. So let me fine. just interrupt. Let me interrupt you for a second there, because yep. because I'm going to be tossing it back to you for a final word in a moment. But I just wanted to take this opportunity to quickly go over to our support.regulatorwatch.com website, which is where you guys can all give us a hand in making our content. As you see, we're getting back into the swing of things here. So this is like five episodes this week. Not all on vaping, though. We are uh, covering this protest situation in Canada as Canada burns to the ground. Uh, but <clears throat> when it comes to this episode, and of course, Demand Vape is our, one of our anchor supporters for our U.S. coverage and really does make it happen. In Canada, for this episode, I didn't want to throw logos up all over the place and so forth for this, but I really want to call out Stealth here in Canada and Divine Laboratories. Both those companies are supporting this episode, as always, with our Canadian coverage. And really, too, as well, everybody you see here, and I mentioned, you know, i got to say this again to John Marshall over at Flavor Crafters. That was my original vape, that pina colada, 24 milligrams, pina colada, 24 million milligrams, 70, 30. I was so right. picky. It was, it was a, yeah. a very, very specific flavor. Absolute Manufacturer, the level yeah. of, of nicotine and the yeah. PG VG ratio was critical to my success. And yeah. so much so for like two years, I used that as like a base mix in all of my other mixing. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. I still use it to this day. Yeah. So when people talk about flavors not being important, they do not know at all what they're yeah. talking about. So, Chris, wrapping this up, um, maybe put in a, a word for the advocacy organization you're working with, because they've got a lot of stuff on the go. And just and give us some hope if you can see there might be it. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I quickly want to touch on the, the flavors thing again, and I think you, you uh, articulated it well, that what makes this attractive to adult smokers is the customi customizability and the flavors, right? So you liked pina colada, whatever, somebody else is going to like something that vaguely tastes like bourbon and Cuban cigars or something. <laughs> if there were only two or three flavors that people actually preferred, you'd go into a vape shop, there'd be two or three flavors, right? Um, but there's not. There's hundreds and hundreds. And so the customizability, you can get different devices, different strengths, different coil, different power, different this, all this sort of stuff, um, is really important to smokers. But the anti-harm reduction side says, oh, well, there's a million flavors and the new devices are coming out all the time. You can't keep it. We just don't know. We just don't know. Um, again, sends the wrong uh, sort of message. 
Um, about rights for vapors, um, it's an interesting, they describe themselves as a kind of loose collection of vaping advocates, and they and they really are. Um, and so I was uh, kind of attracted to that group because they're not tied to big tobacco or particular vaping manufacturers or whatever. It really is a loose collection of advocates, a lot of consumers. And so I like that. So they did a survey. They've now got over 5,000 adult vapors in specialty vape shops to fill out the survey about all kinds of things, flavors, strengths and stuff. Um, and so I stepped in when I saw that because, you know, it was a good survey, but they're not um, really, they don't have any expertise in psychometrics or survey design. So I, I did what I could to kind of clean up the data. But the take home message is adults like flavors, all kinds of different flavors, and a lot of them like more than one flavor. So they don't glom on to pina colada. I don't know if you use other flavors now, but a lot of people use five or six or seven different flavors because they habituate to any one flavor. Um, and people, smokers, start with high nicotine and then they go down. Now, if this was a classic addiction reefer madness thing, they wouldn't be going down. They'd be going up or they'd be puffing more intensely and more frequently. But it turns out they're not. So you started at 24, right, which was probably the highest you could get before the salt nick era. What are you using now? Well, <laughs> uh-oh. Uh oh, uh oh. Just let me you're, check you're for like track. Let me check for track marks here now. Yeah. Uh, one second, yeah. Um, I use uh, fifty. Uh, so okay. Big. Yeah, I mean, I I balls yeah. out, man. I I I nurture a very 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 good nicotine addiction. I'm proud of my addiction. Yeah. I never wanted sure. to quit nicotine. You know, yeah. I wanted to stop dying. That'd be yeah. nice. I wanted to stop yeah. going broke. And yeah. I also wanted to kind of stop not being a smoker because they had made that so ostracizing, right? And for now a the, couple of you, years there, for a couple of years there, people were intrigued with the vaping. And now yeah. you are as evil as you were when you were a smoker. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but the interesting thing about the 50, the Salt Nick, is that um, there's a, a group of people who are making the argument, I think it's a potentially valid one, that... Um, people who use sort of 50, 60 milligram salt neck are going to be consuming less liquid. They're going to be puffing less frequently. And, you know, the, the jewels and, and those things produce a lot less vapor than some of the 200 watt devices. So the argument is that if there is any truth to the, there's a little bit of toxins in there and, you know, using less is better, then salt neck is better, right? Um, the danger of kids using it to get high, you could make it taste terrible and, some teenagers would still do it because they're looking for a buzz. They're not looking for pina colada or tobacco or anything, right? Well, look, I mean, government can't protect kids from everything. That's what parents are oh. for. Yeah, you'd think so. Yeah, well, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, it's interesting yeah. how issues like vaping bring guys like you and I together that, you know, in some other world, we wouldn't have maybe politically met, you know, in the same, in the same way. True. So, so, Chris, look, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming into the show uh, today. Because, And I know that a lot of people were very interested in what you had to say. And uh, please do keep getting out there and saying it. Don't let RegWatch be the only place that people hear your voice. <laughs> oh, once you get me started, you can't shut me up. Well, that's great. Well, just hang tight right there sure. for one second. Well, that is it for this edition of RegWatch. Before you head off, please go on over to support.regulatorwatch.com. That's support.regulatorwatch.com. And consider making a financial contribution to our vaping coverage. It's easy. Just dig into your wallet and find a few dollars and toss them our way. You'll be happy you did, and so will we. And while online, don't forget to like us on Facebook and to follow us on Twitter. For RegulatorWatch.com, I'm Brent Stafford. Have a good one.